Good morning, Astronomy 1020. Uh, welcome to lecture four, part two. Today is our last day of online classes, unless you're in the online version of the class. Section 600 is uh, specifically a distance learning class. So you are gonna continue on this wonderful video journey with us. And I thought I could start today by just coming up with a, or just having a few th statements about how things will change and proceed from here on out. Um, the way this is gonna work will depend upon whether you are in the daytime class, the nighttime class, or in the online class. And uh, I thought at the beginning of the video, <clears throat> excuse me, it might be good to sort of explain that. I'm calling up the schedule with the rooms here right now. Let me uh, go to the whiteboard. Oops, sorry, for just a moment. Let's click on me. Okay, so if you are in the day class, uh, let's see here, we got Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. You guys meet uh, Monday, sorry, Tuesdays and Thursdays, right? So for the day class for section 001, you're gonna be having lectures on uh, Tuesdays and Thursdays. And uh, 001 has lecture 11.30 a.m. Sorry, to 1 p.m. just like we do every day here online. So for you guys, things will seem relatively no <clears throat> normal. We'll just be doing it in person. And uh, I can look at my schedule here. We're gonna be meeting, unfortunately, in room 6004 for our lecture. I might see if I can change that. Uh, everyone meets in the same lab room. So, uh, so KN6004. is our lecture. And actually for the day class, it's gonna feel exactly the same like it is for the live videos. We will have lab on Tuesdays and that's in the astronomy lab room 2050. If you've been to the Warwick campus, you might've walked by, it's got all the glass windows. Uh, and that runs from like, I don't know, 1 p.m. to maybe two or 2.30. Um, on Thursdays, even though it's not a part of your official schedule, that's a chance for us to do homework together. That's our office hours. So just like we do now, we're gonna do homework and we'll probably meet in the same room because there's a lot of board space and it's comfortable. So we'll probably do our homework just like we do now, but on Thursdays. So that's the day schedule. Question. The Tuesday night class has things a little different. The Tuesday night class only meets once per week on Tuesday night. So for the night class, um, okay, here's where things get a little tricky. Night class has lecture six to nine because you've got to do a whole week's worth in one night. And I have a little tea break in there and it's, it's not as horrible as you might think. After lecture, we have lab from 9 to 10 p.m. I try to get us out early if I can. And that leaves us with a fundamental issue of when do we do our homework together and our problem sets. So what I've decided works the best for the night class is we do our homeworks before class from 4 p.m. to 6 p.m. in the conference room that's outside my office. I think it's 2201. It's just a little conference room on the second floor near my office. Now you can gripe about this if you want. I know a lot of you have uh, work sometimes until 5 p.m. Try to come for whatever part of it you can, but I don't think you wanna be doing these homeworks by yourself. And I don't think you wanna be starting them at 10 p.m. And I don't think you wanna be coming to campus just to do that on a different day. So this seems to me to be the best time collectively for us to do it. You guys can give me feedback. I know a lot of you are watching the video later on. I have a question. Yeah. So for those of us who have classes on Thursday, at, they're like during the homework time, what do we do about the homework? Like, 
what you do is this. There's two options. One, you could come to the night class schedule if you're free and you can come to the night class homework. That's option one. Option two is I do have videos of these office hours that you can watch. I don't think they're quite the same because I think when you're all sitting together in the same room, you learn it better. I can kind of walk around and see what you're doing on your paper and help you and critique your style. I can help with button punching on the calculator. It's better for a lot of reasons to do it together. However, I have taught this class before online and I have videos of most of the homework problems that you will have to do. So you could kind of do them yourself watching them remotely. Um, so that's three different options, okay? Okay, what day is the, is the night class homework? Well, I'm telling you right here, right? Okay. Tuesday, okay. Tuesday, homework, 4 to 6 p.m., night 2201. The lecture for the night class is 6 to 9 p.m. We usually have a little tea break in between there because that's the long night. That's going to be in uh, room 6062 on the sixth floor. And there's a little tea break in there. And then we do lab in the same lab room. Uh, lab is uh, 9 to 10 p.m. It's kind of a long night, but we get it done in one, one shot. Uh, and that's in 2050. So people can kind of mix and match if they want. Now, if you're in the I'm online class, which is section 600, I'm going to make you an offer that you can't refuse. You can just keep watching the videos and I'll provide them for you. They might not be from this semester. In theory, it would be cool to record these videos with my camera. What I've discovered is the videos that I try to make at CCRI are weirdly not as good as the videos I make here at my house. And the reason why is here at my house, I've got this little whiteboard, which kind of perfectly fits the screen and I can kind of take notes. But once I'm in the classroom, I kind of want to walk around a lot and interact with people. And there's a big long whiteboard and I like using it. So unless you have like a trained camera operator, which I don't have, it's kind of hard to make a good video unless I restrict myself to this narrow window and talk to the computer instead of the people in the room. And that's also kind of awkward. It's hard to mix and match. I might try to record them anyways to see if they come out good, but I have videos that are more like this from a previous semester that you can use. However, if anyone is in the online class, which is section 600, I don't mind as long as there's seats, the lab room can get kind of squishy, but if you guys want to attend the lectures and maybe even try to attend a live lab or two, I would welcome you to do that. I know you probably don't want to do it. You probably signed up for the online class for a reason. But if there is a person or two out there that wanted to come in and sit on live ones, I guess it doesn't bother me. I'm going to be doing the show at these times anyways, right? So that's what's up. And uh, for those of you who might have a conflict with, uh, with office hours where we do homework, whether you be in the night class or whether you be in the day class, you could do the homework through some online videos that I have. Like I said, especially when it comes to troubleshooting some calculator stuff, it's nice to have me in the room with you, but we make do with what we can do. Does that sound understandable for everyone? Okay, now listen, because uh, this is our last online day, we're also at a kind of interesting juncture in the course where every year when I get to this part, my lectures have not caught up to the next homework. So I'm actually thinking about not having us do a homework today. So basically this week you would only have lab four due. Um, that'll give me a chance to catch up in grading, you a chance to catch up in grading. Oh, and let me say this, because we will not have homework this week, for the first week of going back to school, in other words, next week on Tuesday the 15th, the night class will not meet at 4 p.m. for homework, but they'll actually just meet at 6 p.m. because there's no homework this week. Does that make sense? Or we're not ready. Actually, the weird thing is we're just not ready for the homework yet. <laughs> so the, the night class ends up always being a week behind in homework. That's something you should consider. The homework that I'm doing next week with the day class is the homework that I'll be doing the following week with the night class. The night class is always one week behind for homework. It's just kind of how things work. 
So for the online, do you want me to just continue with homework as scheduled then? Yes, for online, it's just easier if you kind of, although uh, we will now be doing homework number four during week five. Does that make sense? Yeah, okay. And, and what I will do, uh, if that's Amanda in the background there, Amanda, yeah, but... just do you see how I post the lectures to the announcements each week? Mm -hmm. I will continue to post, especially if you are class each week, this is what you should watch and do. So that should help you. You'll just okay. be able to kind of click on the thing and look at what's going on. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, I know it sucks to burn class time and stuff like this, but this matters. I bet you guys were wondering how the hell this was going to work, right? So now you know. And I had to address each section. The daytime is 001, nighttime is 102. By the way, don't forget, if you're in the night class, your section is 102. And the online class is section 600. So I had three separate instructions, depending on what class you're in. Honestly, all right, that's cool, Mikey. You know, honestly, I kind of liked the online thing a little bit, only because all of you were kind of under the same big tent. And let's face it, this method that we've been doing here is quite efficient. It works. It's, oh yeah, and, and Lionel knows because he's been going through this with 1010 as well. It's, it turns out that doing this online has like some weird extra efficiencies. We don't have to drive to campus and do all this other stuff. And if your life is pressed for time, you actually appreciate that. Yeah. Well, I, I don't know, maybe things will change. I'm just a guy trying to work a job and teach you astronomy and have it suck as little as possible. So this is the best I can do. Um, okay. So let's erase and let's get back to our lecture topics. At least today will be kind of a short, fun day, I hope. Uh, let's see here. You know, I'm really debating about that. It, we're not ready to do the homework this week. It is a little tempting to want to ask the night class to just come in and do the homework the same week so that everyone's homeworks are synced up. But uh, I've got to make a call and I'm not sure what the right one is. So. I might send you another email if I change my mind, but right now I'm thinking for the very first week, the night class will just meet at 6 p.m. and we'll do the office hours thing the next week after that. A lot of the issue is I'm talking to Caitlin and Emma and Vincent and sometimes some random person like Amanda chols in from the background, but I still don't know a lot of you because I don't get to interface with you. So I need to sort of read the room. Okay, <clears throat> last time we learned about Newton's version of Kepler's third laws, or sorry, Newton's version of Kepler's laws. And those were really, so this was last time. We're supposed to understand that a little bit. Of all of Newton's version of Kepler's third laws, the, the, the main gist of it is that you have two orbiting bodies. And let's draw a cartoon picture here. One of your orbital bodies is M1. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, the other orbiting body is M2. In M2 is in technically an elliptical orbit, but We'll just pretend it's kind of circular for now. A circle is a special type of an ellipse. So we'll just pretend it's circular, even though we know it's elliptical. And uh, the semi-major axis of the ellipse or the radius of orbit is A. So we want to think of A as kind of like the radius of orbit. And it's the distance center to center between mass one and mass two. We can calculate the orbital period in seconds using the legendary NK3 formula. P squared equals four pi squared A cubed over G times, I'm just gonna substitute in here the total mass of the system where the total mass is, of course, m1 plus m2.
There's another version where we solve for the total mass, and that turns out to be the most important version of the formula. The total mass of the orbital system is 4 pi squared a cubed over g times p squared. Notice that by algebra, I can swap m total and put it up there. And I can take p squared and drop it down there. So it's just sort of mixing and matching. This is, this is the version that you end up using the most often. And for now, we're going to be using it in MKS units. Although later on, we might change that when it's more advantageous to do it. So in other words, the periods will be measured in seconds. The masses will be measured in kilograms, and the A will be measured in meters. All right, that's a review of what we did last time. This is wicked important stuff. You're going to be doing lots of problems using these two formulas on your test, OK? No, no tricks. Uh, please see the orbit of the ISS and the homeworks we did before as examples. And I might be able to provide you with more examples going forward uh, before test time. Today, we want to focus on a bunch of other little bits of stuff that Newton developed with his laws of gravity and his laws of motion that are going to transition us into a new chapter for next week. Next week, we're all about energy and light and radiation. To understand stars, to understand astronomy, you need to understand two things. The first is gravity, because gravity binds stars together and it causes them to orbit each other. The second thing you need to understand is radiation, because these balls of gas and plasma get extremely hot and they pump out tremendous quantities of light. And light is how we observe them, Light is how they interact with other things from planets to clouds of gas. Astronomy is about gravity and light. So this week, you learned about gravity. Next week, light. In fact, we're probably going to spend two weeks on light because it's such a big topic. OK, so let's think about some things that are, that are formulas that we're going to need going forward. Today, I want to cover escape velocity. I want to cover uh, angular momentum and energy. And if I can do those three things, I'll consider this a success. I'm going to erase here, guys, OK? This is like a little review. OK, so let's start with a little module on escape velocity. Escape velocity is a concept that comes from Newton's laws. And um, it turns out to be a really important parameter in astronomy that has a whole bunch of different surprising uses. The symbol that we're going to use for escape velocity is a V with a subscript ESC. And the escape velocity could be defined as that unique speed. It's a fixed constant speed that any object, whether it's a rocket or whether it's a little particle of dust, uh, a unique speed that any object needs to escape the gravity of a some kind of a sphere. It could be a star or planet of mass capital M and radius capital R. My marker is kind of biting the dust here. So I might, even though it's our last online day, bust out one last fresh one. OK, let's draw the little cartoon picture that we're going to need to understand escape velocity. Um, use a circle maker if you have one, or a cup of coffee or something, or a coffee cup. Let's make ourselves a planet or star. We're going to worry more about the escape velocities of stars and planets, but we'll, we'll do both. 
So make yourself a planet or a star and uh, mark the center and draw in the, the star's radius. Right. Draw in the star or planet's mass, M. These are the only parameters that affect escape velocity. Because we often think of this in terms of rocket science, we could, uh, we could actually draw a little, you know, a rocket or some kind of a shuttle that's going to be blasting off. But the, the idea is that it's not really about rockets or shuttles. It's just about any, anything that wants to leave this planet needs the same velocity. And the speed that it's going to have to travel at is the escape velocity. It has a relatively simple formula. The escape velocity is the square root of two times big G times the mass of the planet divided by the radius of the planet. And these are, of course, MKS units. So masses must be measured in kilograms. Radii's must be measured in meters. Okay, test question. What are the units of velocity in the MKS system? Oh. You know, meter square, uh, meter, what was it? Meter square, some, oh, fuck. I don't remember. Damn it, damn it, damn it, damn it, damn it. Here I, I was thinking that that lecture on speed versus velocity was a waste of everyone's time, but I guess it wasn't. Okay, Lionel. The way you answer this question is by answering the, a, a separate question that's related. What are the units of velocity that you use when you drive your car? Uh, miles per hour, I mean, or kilometers. Well, now convert that to MKS. What are the equivalent of miles per hour in MKS units? Ooh, give me a solid second for that. <laughs> really? Kilometers per second. Meters per second. Yeah, standard yeah. units of length are meters. Standard unit of time is seconds. So velocities are measured in meters per second. Okay, we'll try a sample problem in just a moment. Let me show you, uh, well, let me give you a second to capture that. While I drink my iced oolong tea, mm, won't be having any more of this during lecture. Okay. Um, it might surprise you that any object that wants to leave Earth would have the same velocity. Hold on, let me do something here. Whenever I share, I like to share sound in case I end up show you any sound related videos. Here's a cartoon picture. Uh, <clears throat> one thing that Newton's laws of motion teach us is that if you're on a flat plane, right? So let's just kind of draw something over on the side here. So here's a flat plane. And, and if you fire a projectile, like let's say you have a cannon and you, you hold that cannon sideways and you, you fire a projectile out of it, it will travel sort of in a straight line, but ultimately a parabolic arc before it comes down and hits the ground. You know this if you've ever thrown a basketball or a tennis ball, right? If you angle the cannon up, it will kind of make a parabola shape like this. But if you hold it horizontal and fire it, it'll still make a parabola. It just starts flat and drops down. The faster and faster and faster you fire your cannonball, the farther that sort of parabola will go before the, the uh, cannonball hits the ground. But Earth is actually not flat. It's a curved plane. Newton realized that if you were to fire cannonballs at faster and faster velocities, if you were to neglect the effects of air friction, like if you did this on the moon, at some point, since parabolas are conic sections, and since conic sections are allowable orbits under gravity, at some point, if you continue to fire a cannonball faster and faster and faster, 
there will be some speed at which you will pass the curvature of Earth and you will go into a low Earth orbit. In theory, if you fired a cannonball too fast at the surface of the moon, which has no air friction whatsoever, your cannonball could actually go into a low Earth orbit, orbit around the moon, and then boop, hit you in the back of the head, right? That's sort of the escape velocity. That's the velocity at which you pass the curvature of your planet and that unique. Now, it really doesn't matter if it's a cannonball, if it's a dump truck or a dry erase marker. Because things always fall to the ground of your respective planet, according to their little g, the local acceleration of gravity, little g causes any object to accelerate to the ground at the same acceleration. I don't want to say rate here. I want to say acceleration, right? So, so the objects are basically falling around the curvature of Earth. And, and this is just me trying to argue to you without having to derive it why the escape velocity might be a single speed, which depends only on the parameters of the planet and not on the mass of the object which is lifting off. So that's one of the big takeaways here is the mass of the rocket or the mass of the apple does not affect the escape velocity itself. The escape velocity is weirdly a property of the planet itself. And it's kind of an index or a metric of how strong gravity is. But instead of being measured in, I don't know, an acceleration, it's measured as a speed. Why don't we start by calculating the escape velocity of Earth because that's a really great reference point to have. Okay, so as a sample problem, uh, let's find the escape velocity of Earth. Usually we know the mass of Earth in kilograms six times 10 to the 24 kilograms. The radius of Earth is 6,400 kilometers. What should I do first, class? Convert it into uh, meters. We have to convert the radius into meters. Excellent. Um, Emma, you want to help us do that? Where's my little stool here? I volunteer Emma for this task. Emma, uh, you're, you're mute, buddy. Sorry, I made a Hunger Games joke and said I volunteer as tribute. Oh. <laughs> um, um, so we're converting uh, kilometers to meters. Yep. Because we need the MKS units for this. So. Um, so you're going to multiply by the division sign. Hold on, wait, wait. The you're... first step is to is to write down. Oh, the... right, to write down uh, the number with its units. Yeah. Now we make a division bar. Then um, you're going to put kilometers at the bottom and meters at the top, and cancel out. And then you put one at the bottom and a thousand at the top yeah beautiful a thousand meters per kilometer yeah and can you uh then do that in your head without the calculator yeah it should be um let's see uh six four zero 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 and then that would be six point four times ten to the six beautiful and the units are meters yeah Meters. Okay, cool. Uh, let's see if I can squeeze that in down here. So the escape velocity then would be the nice big neat square root. Uh, I don't, guys, this is going to get too smushy for me and my handwriting is going to get bad. I think I'm going to have to go back up here. Sorry. Okay, so the escape velocity for Earth then is the nice big neat square root of two. And maybe I can put the units in blue because that tends to help people a bit. Uh, big G is seven times 10 to the negative 11 meters cubed per kilogram per second squared. 
times six times 10 to the 24 kilograms divided by 6.4 million meters. Punch them up. Remember to do the inside hit equals and then square root. Try to punch it up at home. Anyone have something for me? You guys are kind of slow, huh? I have something, but I don't think it's right, even though I, oh, you know what? I, that's what I didn't do. There we go. So this is what I got. Okay, that's correct. So, all right, now round it right. How would I round that? You would round to how many? Six figs do we have? When in doubt, um, choose two. Yeah, two six figs. So it would be 11. It would be 11 and then... Hold on, hold on. Hold on. You don't have the right to molest your number, Caitlin. There's rounding and then there's molestation. Molestation is when you change your order of magnitude. Oh, okay? yep. Your number is of order 10,000. You do not have a right to turn it into 11. Yep, it's 11. Let me just punch this, everyone. Two times seven EXP negative 11 times six EXP 24 divided by 6.4 EXP six equals shift square root. Clearly, if your decimal point is there, you can't say it's 11, right, Caitlin? Yeah, so it's 11,000, actually. That's right. And what are the units of the 11,000? Um, would it be seconds because you uh, square rooted it? Well, hold on, but. Oh, no, you wouldn't. It wouldn't be that. It would be. Um... No, 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 no. Hold on, Caitlin. Kilograms cancel. That's easy. Yeah. One of the meters cancels with this, and now you have. It too but you have the square root of meters squared per second squared. So it's meters squared then. No, the square root of meters squared per second squared, you have to distribute the square root to both top and bottom. That's how exponent, a square root is an exponent, right? If you cube something, you have to cube top and bottom if you square root. So that's the square root of meters squared over the square root of second squared, right? Which is what? What happens if you mix a square root and a square? Meters per second. Yeah, just meters per second. Right? A square root kills a square, Caitlin. Do you believe me? Okay. Caitlin, now I'm about to mess with you. Even though our escape velocity is listed in meters per second, it's actually customary, Caitlin, to convert it to kilometers per second. Could you help me convert, Caitlin? from meters per second to kilometers per second? How would I do that? So um, obviously you would put your unit that you wanted to convert, which would be 11,000 meters per second. Well, times 11,000 is a number. Yeah. Put, put your units in. Um, so you said, you said uh, kilometers, correct? Kilometers per second is what I want. Kilometers per second. So, um, Honestly, I wouldn't really know how to do that. I know one meter equals a thousand kilometers. That's actually all you need because oh, the, okay. the per second is already there in the bottom. You don't have to okay. mess that. You can treat these completely separate, right? Okay. So what yeah. unit will I put on bottom? My, um, on bottom, it's going to be um, meters. On and top. then top is going to be kilometers. 
Okay. So then you can finally, you can cross out meters and meters. Now you've got kilometers per second. Yep. And then um, you're going to do a thousand for the top. No, uh, one, my bad. Aha, I almost got you there. Um, and then a thousand on the bottom. Because now, yeah, exactly. And so how many kilometers per second is that? Wouldn't that be 11? <laughs> so Caitlin, you would have been right if you had said 11 kilometers per second. Yeah. 11 meters per second was clearly not right. Mm -hmm. And these things do matter, unfortunately. Um, it's customary to express escape velocities in kilometers per second because the numbers come out nice and clean. That's typically how a, how a physicists do it on paper, right? So the escape velocity of Earth is 11 kilometers per second. When we did the uh, escape velocity of Mars in our homeworks last week, Mars was only five kilometers per second, right? <clears throat> Notice that both the mass and the radius depend, uh, affect escape velocity. That's going to turn out to be a big deal when we study the red giants of stars. Red giants might be big, but their outer envelopes of gas are so loosely bound by gravity that's, that stars like Betelgeuse sometimes just burp and giant blobs of plasma go shooting off their surfaces. We call them stellar winds. It's kind of cool. OK. Um, this is a module that I needed to do for so many cool things that we're gonna discuss later in our class. It might seem a little bit disconnected from everything, but technically these concepts fall under the heading of Newton's laws of motion. So I wanted to squeeze it in here while I could. Uh, do we feel like we have this stuff? Cause I need to erase, all right. No objectors here. Okay. Oh, you know, by the way, guys, I guess I should mention just for funsies. Did you know the limit of our current sort of rocket technologies? We're only really good at getting rockets up to about 10 kilometers per second because you have to keep putting more and more fuel in a rocket as it's a little complicated to explain. One of the reasons we're able to get to space at all is, is because the earth is actually spinning. And if you think about it, on a spinning Earth, you actually have a velocity through space because you travel the, well, if you're on the North Pole, you don't really have a velocity through space. You just do this in 24 hours. But as you go south from the North Pole, you traverse some circular circumference in a 24 hour day. And if you convert the circumference of Earth, which is like 40,000 kilometers by 24 hours, the speed that you get close to the equator is about one kilometer per second. So what we often do to get rockets into space is we take them as far south as possible, like, I don't know, Cape Canaveral, Florida, right? One of the southernmost points of the United States. And we fire our rockets in the direction of the spin of Earth at 10 kilometers per second. And the Earth's spin gives you the last kilometer per second that you need to get in like space. a slingshot kind of yeah, yeah. And, and in fact yeah. if you ever get to see a shuttle launch i mentioned this because caitlin your your uh, grandpa or your uncle or something was into this stuff yeah. so there's a cool picture I, of a i shuttle. actually watched something yesterday on disney plus about um launching um one of the rovers to mars and they had and so the point of where they had to launch it in order to reach Mars, they can only do it once every 26 months. So uh -huh. they had to time it extremely perfectly or right. else it wouldn't have reached it, which I which now that you're talking about this, it's really cool because I can now like understand, oh, that's why they did that. Yeah, there's a name for that that launch window. I think it's called a Hummin orbit or something like that. They need yeah, to it, the Earth, and, but don't forget, it's also complicated by the fact that Earth and Mars are running around the track at the, at different speeds. Yeah, and that's what they were talking about, and that's why they had to time it perfectly, plus the velocity and everything. It was really cool. Now that you like you're mentioning that, I'm like, oh, that makes so much sense now. Actually, can I tell you something? Uh, I saw a simulation where you actually had to kind of pick, you tried to simulate uh, a rocket launch. Oh yeah, here. 
this is it. Uh, someone sent me a bunch of cool, uh, like little animations. And I want to see if you can see this. Uh, I only meant, it's so funny that you mentioned this because I can put this link in the chat window, but check this out, Caitlin. In this simulation, you practice being an engineer and you get Earth kind of racing around and then you have to decide when to launch. Oh, I, I see how it works. So here's Earth and Mars. The date is January 1st of 2000. So let's kind of cycle this thing forward here. I think it's somewhere around here where you have to try to launch your shuttle to see if it gets to Mars. Let's see if I did this. Uh, let's hit it, boom. Ooh, damn, I missed. Okay, so this is probably what that, oh, wait, are they gonna give me a chance to hit it again? No, mission failed. Okay, retry. So uh, that was the second, let's, I need to catch up to Mars a little bit, somewhere around here, I think, boom. Come on, baby, come on, baby, damn it. I got a question, You uh, did you end up getting the email I sent you yesterday? I did, I just didn't, uh, I, I got caught up in some uh, some other stuff, so I didn't. Oh, okay, I just wanted to make sure it went through. Come on, baby, I think I'm gonna get it, yeah! Ah, damn it, okay, anyways, this is tough stuff, right? So you. You know, of course, and they would actually perform a calculation rather than just doing it randomly. Come on. Well, because when they do it, they ship like they're sending like millions of dollars worth of electronics into space. Oh, here I go. Yes, mission successful. Okay. Anyways, uh, I'll share this with you. You can play around with it. It's kind of fun. Uh, here, uh, copy. There's all kinds of fun. That things. makes me regret picking nursing as my major. <laughs> you know, um, in my opinion, there's no major that's cooler or more badass than physics and astronomy. It's it's really hard. It'll give you like it'll make you sweat. But it's kind of like getting addicted to spicy food. Once you get addicted to spicy food, if food doesn't bite back, it's not fun anymore. And that's exactly how physics is. Okay. Yeah, it's like it's like getting addicted to tattoos too. <laughs> Well, I get it. I used to be a nursing major, and now here I am as a mathematics major. So yeah, if I don't get into the nursing program, I'm going into like chemistry or something sciencey. I'll tell you guys, as a as a local Rhode Islander such as yourselves, um, it was so great for me. It 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 lifted me into a whole new level uh, of thought, and it was really good for me mentally. And it also provided me with really cool jobs that are interesting. Like, for instance, talking to cool young people about shuttle launches, right? Take a look at this totally awesome photograph. It's a picture of a shuttle launch from like the cockpit of an F-15 here that's flying overhead. And you can see when the shuttle's launching, you can see it taking a curve into the direction of Earth's rotation to get that extra kilometer per second boost to get the space. Also makes you realize you know, how terrifying it must be to be in one of these miss you're basically strapping yourself to a missile and firing yourself into the direction of Earth's rotation to get the space. You've got to be very brave to do something like that. You know, uh, it's totally wild. <clears throat> um, I do hope that we uh, have a future in the next hundred years or two where, where everyday people get to go to space. I think that would be really exciting, you know. Okay. Um, well, that's not going to happen if we don't study our physics. So let's learn a few more things. I want to talk to you guys about some concepts that are initially based on Newton's laws in motion. But if you follow them to their logical conclusion, you end up meditating on energy. And in my opinion, energy, the concept of energy is the gateway drug to thinking about light and radiation and atoms and other cool stuff like that. So I wanna do a module on angular momentum and I wanna do a module on energy. I have a really cool demo for angular momentum, but I might just show it to you in class next week. Uh, one of my older videos has the demo, so I might actually look that up. It involves a bicycle wheel. The, the problem is I didn't wanna to go to CCRI and get all this junk and bring it to my apartment just to have to bring it back tomorrow, right? So it. Uh, I'll, I'll do this demo for some of you in class, or, or maybe I can even find the video from last year. Let's first start by talking about a concept like momentum. Up to now, the physics quantities that we've dealt with have been speeds, velocities, accelerations, and forces. And all of those things are pretty straightforward concepts that we understand. We understand speed. If you drive in a car, you understand what velocity means. 
um, forces are pushes and pulls. So they're not super abstract. But now we're going to define some quantities that are a little bit more abstract. But if you're willing to think abstract, give you deep insight into physical systems. And the first one is what we might call linear momentum. For some reason in physics, linear momentum gets the symbol P. And linear momentum is defined as the product of a moving object's mass times the velocity, all right? So oftentimes, uh, when I think of momentum, I think of it as the amount of oomph of a moving object or something like that. That's not an official definition. That's one of my kooky thoughts. Uh, the amount of oomph of a moving object. Um, and momentum explains things like how particles behave when they undergo collisions with one another. Uh, here, damn it, I don't have my little office toy. I had one of those Newton's cradle things, but yeah. let's see what I've got in the old slideshow instead. The, um, there's a popular office toy called uh, Newton's cradle. I've got one of these in my physics cart down at the office, right? And, and all of these steel ball bearings are suspended on strings. And if you lift one back and forth, they kind of click back and forth like a, like a metronome. As one particle travels with velocity, it transfers momentum from itself through the stationary spheres into the one at the end, which then pops off the end and they click clack back and forth. I really, this is one class I knew I was gonna miss my demos, but I didn't have the heart to go schlepping all that stuff around for um, a single one hour lecture. Um, uh, probably a, a more comfortable analogy is if you think about how, how a game of pool works, right? When you play a game of pool, this is slide 30, F5, 30. The, the cue ball is given some momentum from your stick and it travels with a velocity V. It has some inherent mass. And think about what happens when it strikes one of the other billiard balls. It comes completely to a rest and the other ball begins to move almost as if by magic. Now in the 1800s, I think, or the 19, 1800s, people thought of momentum as kind of like a fluid that could gracefully pass from one object to another. And it has that kind of a quality. When the two objects have the same mass, usually the first ball during a collision, during a, an elastic collision, will come completely to rest and the second ball will actually gain the momentum and move. Um, it's more interesting what happens when the balls have varying masses. And there are different sorts of extremes, okay? So two, two spheres, absolutely, Caitlin. And what's magic is the, the surprising stuff. <laughs> um, when the spheres have equal, equal masses, one usually comes to a rest and the other gets to move. Um, the other cases that can happen are kind of fun are like a bowling ball and a BB, if you have two very asymmetrical masses. If a bowling ball strikes a BB, it kind of becomes like a snow plow and its momentum is so great that it carries the two together forward. If a BB strikes a bowling ball, usually it does not have enough momentum to move the bowling ball, bink, so it kind of ricochets off and bounces back. So those are the extreme cases. If the masses are equal, one comes to rest and the other moves. If one mass is way more extreme than the other, either you get a ricochet or you get a snowplow. And then for situations where there's only a slight asymmetry during collision, some, some combination of the two happen where there's a bit of a ricochet and there's a bit of a, a, a transfer of momentum. What's cool about momentum is, and this is what makes, if you guys wanna talk about magic, as some of you were in the uh, chat box there, Momentum in physics is a conserved quantity. This, my friends, this is what makes it magic. 
in physics, we hunt for conserved quantities because they let us predict the future as if we were Nostradamus, as if we were some kind of a fortune teller. Um, if the total momentum in a box is constant, you can predict what will happen after two things bump into each other. If you know the initial momentum, if you know how fast the two particles were traveling, you can predict what happens after they collide. And that actually can seem like magic to an outside observer. Linear momentum is usually a pretty straightforward concept. People are hardwired to understand it, right? Um, if you were to go to a parking garage at your local supermarket, and there was a shopping cart and a baby in a shopping cart that was on a runaway, a runaway drop down the parking ramp. Let's say your shopping cart's traveling at five meters per second and oh, the baby's gonna die, right? Now you might be a hero and be tempted to stand out in front of that shopping cart and stop the baby. However, if the baby was in a runaway school bus, even if the school bus was only traveling at five meters per second as it rolled down the ramp, you would suddenly realize that you were not the hero you thought you were. You would intrinsically know that a shopping cart traveling at five meters per second is not the same thing as a school bus traveling at five meters per second because the school bus has more mass. And, oh no, Mikey, I'm giving Mikey trigger warning. Okay, Mikey's going through trauma here. All right, work it out in therapy, bro. Okay, so uh, you know that mass adds oomph to your moving object, right? Um, so linear momentum is an intuitively understandable concept. Even if you're a baby and like Mikey, you have some trauma of this. What's interesting in physics is every physics concept, whether it's momentum or torque, I'm oh, sorry, or, or forces or energy, when you start to add rotation to the mix, rotation makes things so complicated. Rotation just creates a sort of evil twin Wario brother that, that screws up every physics concept. It doesn't screw it up, it makes it more interesting, okay? Oh, gosh. <laughs> okay, Caitlin. <laughs> um, <clears throat> while linear momentum is interesting, I really want to talk to you about its evil twin, angular momentum. May I erase this, uh, guys? Okay. So introducing a related concept and one that's very important in astronomy, and it's called angular momentum. For some reason, the symbol that we use for angular momentum is the letter L. And um, it's defined in an almost similar way. The angular momentum of an object is its mass times its velocity. But now we're going to multiply it by a radius of orbit, R. And you know sometimes they call R the moment arm. Let's look at a classic kind of angular momentum setup here. Uh, let me show you guys here. Okay, so this would be the most generic sort of form angular momentum could take. Um, you're an Ewok, you've got a little stone on a slingshot and you're whipping it around, okay? You've got some particle of mass M. It's bound by a string to have some radius of orbit and it's got a velocity V. And if you multiply these three quantities, mass times velocity times radius, you get this, this kooky thing called angular momentum. And angular momentum, like its brother, linear momentum is a conserved quantity. Let's write that down because that's a big deal. Angular momentum is a conserved quantity. And that means that the total angular momentum in a system has to have a constant value. And this leads to some very funky experimental results. Angular momentum also has a direction and the direction is a little hard to explain. If you have your pivot point 
and your radius of orbit, and here's your particle m. As your particle m travels around a circle at some velocity v, the direction in which the particle travels is constantly changing. At one moment, the, the mass is traveling in this direction. At another moment, it travels in that direction. And a moment later, it's traveling like so. In this sense, it doesn't make any sense to try to define angular momentum in the direction of the particle's motion because the particle keeps changing its velocity arrow and pointing in different directions. The only thing that makes sense to define the direction of angular momentum is to point it in the direction of the one thing that is not changing. And this is gonna sound kooky, but the way we define the direction of angular momentum is we define it as along the axis of rotation. Because the axis of rotation stays fixed. And there's a lot of cool, interesting effects that happen because of this. Um, let me show you, uh, I wonder what, what's the easiest way to do this. At this point, I would love to do a very cool demo. Uh, I wonder if I could find, what is this? This is lecture four. I wonder if in a previous class, I may have done this demo. And like I said, I, I was really debating whether I should grab all this junk. This is, didn't get this. This is lecture four. I'm, I'm being more efficient this year than I was before. Maybe lecture five. Uh, one of these classes probably has this. Here we go. Let's see. I just want to see if I can find this quick. All right, so lecture five. Oh, I should have, I'm sorry, guys. I didn't think that I was going to, I thought I was going to wait to show this to you guys uh, when we got back in class, but now I'm like more and more desperate. I just sort of, I'm in the mood to show you this demo, put it that way. Okay, so it must be just before this one, lecture four, homework four. Let me see if I've got this angular momentum demo in here. That would be so cool. Ah, bloody hell. Okay, well, momentum mini game, that sounds fun. So, ang oh, here we go, here we go. Okay, sorry guys, that took a minute, but I can plagiarize myself, that's fair, right? So let's see if we can see this cool demo here. Uh, can I scrub? It's really hard to scrub these videos because they're so long, as you guys probably already know. I just, this is 102. Here we go, here we go. So stop me if you've heard this one before, because. Oh yeah, here we go. All right, so check this out. I can plagiarize myself. And one of the weird things about linear, uh, about angular momentum is when you make a thing start to spin, the only good way to define its direction is to define the direction of spin. Now this is gonna sound weird, we define the direction of spin as pointing along the axis of the spin. I just want you to see you me can't define yank this thing go up here. Because the tire is always pointing in a different direction as it rotates. Can you guys hear this okay? The one direction that stays fixed is the axis of rotation. So we define the axis as the direction of momentum. Once I give, now this bicycle wheel. This is the part that I want you to see here. Happens to be dangling from a string. And when it's not rotating and I hold the string, gravity just flops over the bicycle wheel, right? That's what it does. But watch what happens if I give the bicycle wheel some angular momentum. Here we go. 
I can now hold it by the string and gravity is unable to pull over the tire. It's really cool when you That's see this. This is the conservation of angular momentum. Watch this. I can even try to knock it over. I can't do it. Even if I give this thing a whack, In fact, I could almost practically. Now, if you guys see this gyro motion that's undergoing here, this is called precession. What's happening is gravity is trying to pull the wheel over and down. The contravangular momentum says, F you, I don't want to fall over. But the, the trade off is that it ends up rotating and spinning around in a circle. It's called precession. Um, this hey, is so that was just a quick demonstration. I've been trying to think of other cool ways to demonstrate angular momentum. And I saw this toy advertised on, um, on Amazon Prime. It turns out that it kind of muddles the message because there's a little propeller in here and this kind of works under the principle of dynamic lift. But maybe I'll bring this into uh, to our lectures if we're in person. The conservation of angular momentum has so many weird buggy results. Like it, it, it does goofy things. Like it keeps you upright on your bike when you're traveling. You can use gyroscopes to, you know, segways, those little nerdy things that people ride around on. Those can stay upright using the conservation of angular momentum. This thing, I forget what they call it, a boomerang ball. It's really dope. I got it for like 25 bucks on Amazon. And there's a little uh, plastic propeller. It's very lightweight. It's a plastic cage. And, and the thing lifts itself up through dynamic lift like a helicopter. But the conservation of angular momentum causes it to do really buggy things that you wouldn't expect. Like, let's face it, you're just so used to normal things like tennis balls, you kind of throw them and they travel in a parabola. But this thing has got angular momentum bound up in it, keeping it spinning. But if you change the vector or the orientation, the conservation of angular momentum causes it to do some pretty buggy things. So let's get on with it here. So you kind of shake this thing and you can kind of get it to like float up in the air. Ah. I really wish I could sh Let's see here. All right, I'm probably going to break something, but woo, I don't know. <laughs> well, my cat doesn't like it very much, but um, I've gotten to play around with it with like my friends where we can kind of, the way you can throw it from one friend to another is you actually take it and you push it up and angular momentum kind of causes it to sail in this weird float. Sometimes if you throw it just right, if you put some spin on it, you can throw it and it will travel out into space and then come back to you. I, I haven't like mastered it. I only got this thing like two weeks ago. So I've been trying to master some cool tricks that I could do in like a classroom, uh, but maybe we can goof around with that. I'll bring it into to class next week and you can see how it works. It's super fun to play with. Anyways, the conservation of angular momentum is a big deal in astronomy because guess what? Every freaking thing in space is rotating. You live on a rotating sphere, which is rotating around the sun, which is also rotating, which is orbiting around the center of the galaxy. And the galaxies themselves are undergoing these complex collisions. Angular momentum has profound effects on our solar system and beyond. And it's kind of a big deal in, in astronomy. In fact, the place where it really first showed its head, let's get rid of me here. By the way, if you're in the 600 class, you'll see that I have great lectures for all this stuff that you'll be able to watch. And there are also, you know, you'll see me doing homework problem sets uh, almost identical to the ones we're doing now. So, so you'll be able to kind of follow along just fine if you have to miss a class or something. Uh, I wanna go to my lecture show and I wanna talk about one place where we saw angular momentum come into play was in Newton's version of Kepler's three laws. Let's, let's consider what's happening here. Uh, what is this, slide 69 or 70? One of the reasons we can understand why a particle speeds up is, uh, what, what, why a planet speeds up when it's close to the sun is as a planet orbits the sun, when it's at aphelion, the radius of orbit is at the greatest possible extent. Now, if angular momentum is conserved, mass times velocity times radius, when your radius is very long, for momentum to be conserved, the velocity has to drop. You can't really change the mass of your planet. 
And this number has to stay fixed. That's what the conservation of angular momentum means, that the product of mass times velocity times radius is a constant value. On the other hand, as your radius of orbit shrinks near perihelion, if this goes down, the velocity of your planet has to go up to compensate. This is one of the reasons why we only see Halley's Comet every 76 years. The orbital period is 76 years, but it spends most of those 76 years out here at the edge of our solar system near Neptune. When it actually comes interior to the sun, its velocity is so high that it might only spend a half a year or a few months traveling past Earth and the sun. This is just one example how angular momentum shows up in physics and astronomy. Important concept. OK, uh, I'll leave it there. I don't think that was my best work for angular momentum, but at least we've talked about it. Angular momentum has kind of funky units, by the way. Um, we, we'll talk about that some other time. I want to introduce energy first. OK, uh, last module for the day. How am I doing on time? I've got just a, a couple of minutes left. Um, I want to just do a little brief stint about energy. And energy is what's going to dominate our conversations uh, next week. Energy is an abstract quantity like momentum. At first, it's harder to think about. But if you start thinking in terms of energy, you can see secrets into nature. The actual definition of energy is almost too subtle for you to be able to handle it your first time around. The definition, it's like, it's too abstract. The official definition of energy is so simple. It is a force multiplied through a distance. But this can take a lot of different forms. So let's have some notes, some bullet points to help you get started with energy. Like its friend's momentum, energy is a conserved quantity. Meaning the total energy in a box must be a constant value. You guys have heard of this as the conservation of energy, kind of a big deal in physics. Um, what's cool about energy is energy is almost like a ghost. It can take forms that are surprising. It can transfer through walls and all kinds of funny things. It, it's like a shape-shifting beast, okay? So energy can take various and surprising forms. But those forms come under a sort of, there's a couple of different classifications on which energy can come in. So one of those forms are potential energies. Potential energies are stored in a force field. That's gonna sound kind of Star trek -y, but so what? That's how it is. That's not stones, that's stored, sorry. Looks, looks weird. Potential energies are energies that are stored in a force field. Then there are kinetic energies. Kinetic energies are associated with moving objects. And then there's kind of a third form of energy. There's potential energy and kinetic energy. And then there is light. I would like to argue that light is a very pure form of energy that has aspects of kinetic and potential, but it's not either one. So light is a very pure, unique form of energy. And if all of that stuff is sounding a little abstract, it's because I wanted it to be so. Usually your best introduction to energy is to start by studying specific types like gravitational potential energy or the kinetic energy of motion or temperatures and heats. And then to kind of over time start to connect the dots and see how they're all related. What I'd like to do with our last five minutes is just give you a couple of quick examples 
that we could do a calculation with and hope that over time it starts to build up an insight. I, of course, also very much want to talk about the units of energy because we're going to be working with many different units of energy. Because energy can take so many different forms, there are so many different units of energy, which, which would surprise you. Okay, I'd like to erase here to, under, uh, to talk about a particular type. One of the first things I'd like to do today is just to define something called gravitational potential energy. Gravitational potential energy is the energy stored in a gravitational field. And it goes something like this. Here's a heavy massive object. It's a bocce ball. And I think a bocce ball is probably really close to one kilogram in mass. If I had to guess, it feels like about the same heft as my one kilogram test mass. So this bocce ball, when left to its own devices in the gravitational field of Earth, will obviously desire to fall down and stick to the ground. That's what gravity wants to do to it. But I am going to use some energy. So this morning, I had an excellent breakfast of cashews and blueberries, because not because I'm healthy, but because they were the first things that I could grab with my hands when I was trying to peel my eyes open. OK, so I had blueberries and cashews for breakfast, and I gave my muscles some energy. And what I'm going to do now is I'm going to fight against the field of gravity. I'm going to start by putting this thing down here on the ground, OK? And I'm going to lift it up over my head. Give some cashew energy. Here we go. And I'm going to hold it up in the air about two meters, OK? And once this thing is dangling up in the, I've actually fought against gravity, right? I had to push. Gravity is trying to push it down, and I'm fighting against gravity. This is where the force multiplied through the distance things comes in. Gravity wants it to go down. I'm fighting against it. And once I hold it up in the air, I have created some gravitational potential energy. And I can do things with it, right? I could take this bocce ball and I could hold it out the window and I could release the gravitational potential energy on some unsuspecting citizens below if I was a sinister sort of person. That would be a dubious use of my gravitational potential energy. The idea is that you have the ground, here's Earth, okay? And you push up some kind of an object of mass M and you lift it up some height H above the ground. And we define our potential energy, our gravitational potential energy as mass times little g times height. Now, I think this is one of the easiest and most clean forms of energy for a person to start off by thinking about. Because for instance, let's say you've got your, your one kilogram or your two kilogram mass and you've suspended it. Let's say in my case that the bocce ball had a mass of one kilogram. And let's say that the height was something like two meters. Because if you think about it, if I lift it over my head, that's about two meters off the ground. You guys know what little g is, right? What's little g for Earth? 10 meters squared. 10 meters per second squared. It's the local acceleration of Earth's gravity. So ask yourself, once the thing is held up over my head, where is the energy? The energy is invisible. It's not exactly in the mass. It's not exactly in the invisible space between, and it's not exactly in the ground. The energy is stored in the entire system of ground plus space plus mass. In fact, 
if you think about it, this is kind of like a spring, right? Gravity is like a spring. If I stretch a spring, it wants to snap back to its equilibrium position or a rubber band, right? This is like a rubber band in that I'm stretching the mass away from Earth. And if I take my hand off the mass, whoosh, it'll snap right back into place. The energy is in the form of holding that gravity. And at any point, I can go pew, bombs away and I can release that energy and, and get the energy to do work in the form of my, my mass uh, collapsing to the ground. Let's, let's find the units of energy. And let's do so by using my example, one kilogram mass, two meters above the ground on Earth. The potential energy there would be one kilogram. Here I'll use blue for the units to keep them separate. Times 10 meters per second squared. Times, uh, let's see. Uh, two meters, right? One times 10 times two is 20. Can you guys tell me the units? Would it be kilograms per second squared? But this meter is on the top. But do you see how this meter looks like it's in the middle? Vincent, that meter is also on the top. You're always in a secret numerator unless you're explicitly in a denominator, correct? Want to try again? Vincent, you're almost there. Try one more time. Caitlin? Okay, wouldn't it be kilograms times meters squared um, over second squared? Beautiful, that's right. So the only mistake that Vincent made is he thought these meters were gonna cancel out. But Vincent, this is the top and this is also the top. That's kind of sneaky, right? So yeah, it's kilogram meters squared per second squared. You can either say that kilograms times meters squared, or you could just say kilogram meters squared per second squared. Now, here's where energy starts to get a bit head scratchy. I know what a kilogram is, and I know what a meter is, and I know what a second is, right? But a kilogram meter squared per second squared is hard to think about. This is a good time for us to hide our confusion by defining a new unit called the joule. In other words, we're going to call this 20 joules of energy. And the abbreviation for the joule is just a capital J. So that's how a scientist would write that. So let's, um, for our very last set of notes, I'm just going to walk you through a couple of different uh, energy units. And then uh, we'll kind of move on from there. And we'll be able to start with atoms and light when we meet in person next time. So the point that I've been trying to make here, well, several different points. Okay, let's define some units of energy. If we were to use the MKS system, in the MKS system, a joule, now we use a triple equals for defined as, a joule is defined as one kilogram times a meter squared per second squared. In the imperial system of units, which the United States uses, or the British system of units, the unit is actually called the calorie with a lowercase c. A calorie is 4.2 joules. The calorie in the British system, which is defined in terms of raising like a cubic centimeter of water, one degree, 
Fahrenheit, I can't remember exactly how it's originally defined, is a little different than the food calories that you're used to. Food calories are actually kilocalories or 4,200 joules. For some reason, the US Department of Agriculture of the FDA, they don't like to use kilos because it sounds like metric, like you're some kind of snobby European. So they've done this hideously awful thing. They redefine the food calorie as also the calorie with a capital C. And that's hideously bad for us. So if Diet Coke has just one calorie, it's actually just one kilocalorie or 4,200 joules. Um, when you pay your gas bill, you might use uh, a unit called therms. I think therms are something like 100,000 British thermal units or something. I can't remember exactly the number. Uh, British thermal units are often called BTUs. So both therms and BTUs are units of energy that you'll see when you buy like an air conditioner or, or a stove or something like that. Um, when you pay your electric bill, you're paying for energy. And there we use something called a kilowatt hour, a kilowatt times an hour. I've got a homework problem next week where we work on that. Um, when we're gonna work next week in the tiny microscopic world of atoms, Atoms have energy transitions that are wicked small amounts of joules. So we define this unit called the electron volt. And an electron volt, which is one EV, is a wicked tiny packet of energy equal to 1.6 times 10 to the negative 19 joules. Weirdly, because we're going to be dealing with photons and atoms, we tend to either work in joules in this class or we tend to work in electron volts. Those are the two units of energy that astronomers like the most. There are others besides this, but these are some that you might have seen before in your everyday life. If you even just look at these various things, you realize how many weird and wacky forms that energy can take. I've only told you about one, which is gravitational potential energy, but I'm sort of out of time, so I think I'm going to leave it there. This is a pretty good place to stop. Um, okay, so although uh, two of our homework questions next week have to deal with energy, some of our homework questions also deal with wavelengths and frequencies of light. I would just like to do more before I do next week's homework. And I don't think anyone here is gonna to object to having a, a week off from homework, right? That doesn't bother anyone tremendously? Okay, Mikey's cool with it, okay. Now, let's be clear. You guys still owe me something this week, which is the lab that we did, lab four period of the ISS. I guess you guys have probably already done it because you usually do it with me. But I'm talking to all you kids out there in the Troll Factory watching the videos later. Make sure you've got lab four into me by Sunday and next week we'll pick up, okay? Mm -hmm. So I'll see the daytime students at 11.30 a.m. on Tuesday in room 6004. I will see nighttime students at 6 p.m. on Tuesday and I will see, uh, buh, 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 buh. I will see uh, online people. I'll be sending you some more videos to watch either from a previous semester or I'll see if the recordings that I can make in the lecture hall are, are worthwhile to watch. I'll, I'll just try to pick the best ones. So uh, be in touch if you need me, otherwise I'll see you guys next week, okay? Over and out.